Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? Welcome to episode number 83 of the White Knuckle Podcast, powered by Ozonix. Undetectable, undeniable. Today we are going to air the show that we aired on YouTube in video form, um, and that show was our public land recap show with uh, the guys from the hunting public, uh, Dan Infault from the Hunting Beast, Todd, uh, Scott Buckley, Curtis Zabel from Behind the Bow, and then the one and only world famous Lucas Psycho. So uh, with the help of... Uh, Dave Prochno and Scott Hemmen, we were able to capture all this on audio as well as video and are bringing it here to you today. Hopefully you'll be able to pick up some nuggets of information. Do me a favor, if you're listening to it or watching it on YouTube, give us a like or a comment and let us know what you thought of the show. And uh, the guys that uh, did the show would certainly appreciate that, and so would we. If you're listening to it on uh, Stitcher Radio, on iTunes, or on any of the uh, podcast platforms, please give us a review on one of those platforms. We could always use your reviews. They help us get better at what it is that we do. And lastly, before we get going, thanks to Ozonix for uh, truly making all of this possible and the travel and, and things of that nature, the equipment that it took to, to get ready uh, we appreciate their support because without that we wouldn't be able to afford to put this on for you guys so with that here is the show i'm scott buckley from iowa on a lot of public land um iowa kansas nebraska wherever it takes me <laughs> i'm greg clements i'm originally from eastern nebraska live in southern iowa now and part of the hunting public. Uh, we just got off of our spring turkey tour. Uh, I'm looking forward to the whitetail tour this fall. It's going to be exciting. We're going to a bunch of different states, and I'll let Aaron talk about the states we're going to. Oh, yeah, we're going everywhere. We're going to try to hit them all. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm Aaron Warburton with the hunting public, and uh, yeah, I'm from Paris, America, down in uh, Little Town, Missouri, about 800 people in it. And I just moved up to Iowa about seven, eight years ago and been here ever since. We pretty much just hunt public land and chase deer and turkeys around every day if we can. I'm Dan Info, the guy sitting next to Aaron. Or... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Southeast Wisconsin, I'm mostly public. My name's Todd Pringnitz, uh, White Knuckle Productions, born and raised in Michigan, grew up hunting there, and now I uh, am fortunate enough to live here and hunt big Iowa whitetails. Mm. Curtis Zabel from Wisconsin, um, hunt all public land. Um, yeah. There's something to do with behind the boat, too, huh? Yeah, from behind the boat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lucas Psycho, North Dakota, born and raised. I hunt about 90% public, and Throw in a little bit of private so I can relax <laughs> a little bit. So, uh, First question comes from Mike Catlin. Um, it's going to be for Scott. Uh, in your opinion, does the pattern that bucks follow change during the rut? He means you spend all the time during the year to find where they're bedding down and traveling and in the early season. As the rut approaches, they travel farther away from that particular area. Does your traveling to locate them, or or do you travel to locate them, or do they eventually bet down in the same spot year-round? Um, they, they change bedding areas from, from um, time to time. Um, I don't... I'm just thinking of examples here. Um... <clears throat> yeah, anybody else answer that one? Kind of well, I, I, just from my experience here, like we were just talking with some of the guys um, earlier, 
And I really don't even have bucks on my property yeah. until later in October. So in the summertime, when we were, we were out thinking around yesterday, I used to be so paranoid about walking on my property and making noise or doing this. Now it's like in the summertime, I'm running around on my property because those bucks are in different locations. And then as the rut starts to approach, your big dominant bucks seem to move into where the the best doe bedding areas are and where the concentration. Yeah, happens. I guess you could say that. My farm, same way. Now I think yeah. about it. Yeah, because right now that some of the bucks are just starting to move in. And um, yeah, they really pile into my areas in the rut. And, um, yeah. What I see is a, a shift in the bedding at rut. It's a predictable shift. It happens every year. Yeah, the same in the same place spots. every year. Yeah, <clears throat> you'll see the same sign pop up, and they're usually bedding more in relation to the does. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, here, mine literally will bed right in the middle of these different doe bedding areas, and I, they use the does' ears and eyes and noses to basically alert them if any, anything comes in. So half the time, you just got to beat the does in order to get to the box. But that's where all these big ones, Walter Payton, and all these big ones behind me, they were literally they set up camp right in those doe bedding areas. And usually it's right next to a kill plot or a, a major green food source. And so that's what I use to manipulate them is putting these different food plots. And you basically just control where the does are, concentrate them, and then every big buck's going to want to be there at some point. Yeah. <clears throat> I got something for that. Yeah. And, and kind of where I hunt, I've noticed that it's, it's almost buck, you know, it's almost buck to buck. You know, it, they're all kind of their own way. It seems that there's some that are... They're constantly moving, it seems like. You see them everywhere. And if you have cameras spread out, you know, I kind of got away from that a lot, but through the years of using them, I'd see where some bucks are always on the move somewhere. No matter what their age was, it was just they're a, they're a, they're on-the-move buck. And then I've noticed there's some that are just like every year, they have a pocket, and they like to run that one pocket. And then once they run out, then they might venture off a little bit, but most of the time you'd see, like, Oh, that buck, he, he, that's, his, that's his house. You know, there ain't nothing that comes in and out of there but him, and he runs that spot, and then there's others that are just constantly on the move. You know, that's what I've seen anyways, but I, I, I agree. Them doe bedding areas, you know, yeah. you're going you're gonna to get the majority of any bucks that are on the move, on the look, and you're going to catch them in between those spots. And, and uh, yeah. So when I like scout in the springtime, I'm mainly looking for, like, when I'm looking for the, the buck bedding, um, that's, like, I'm, I'm focused, when I'm finding just buck beds, I'm thinking to myself, to myself, that's early season, pre-rut, like, late season. And then I'm, when I'm finding the doe bedding areas, then I'm thinking that that's what I'm going to hunt during the rut. Mm -hmm. so. Well, if I can uh, step in for a second, too, is I do find uh, good rut bedding. And I do find it in early season too. But when you're scouting in spring and you find what beds, usually they're not as worn in as the beds that people are typically looking for, those worn in ones where you can really see them. The rut beds are only used for a week or two during the rut. But what you do see is they're marked up real well. There's rubs all around them. They're, you know, where the early season bedding and the late season bedding doesn't always have that. They'll have one or two rubs around them or whatever. But the rut beds, you'll see them tore up. Right. You agree? Yep. I agree. Yeah. Yep, definitely. I would say uh, there's just one example that comes to mind. I would say with us, like that buck nest a few years ago, we actually jumped a mature buck out of it when scouting it in the middle of June, and he was right in the middle of the secure primary bedding location. Came back a year and a half later, hunted it on October 1 through the 7th, and there was four mature bucks in the same bedding area. And until that bedding area received human pressure, there was almost always a mature buck in it. Um, and it was a variety of situations and a variety of bucks that used that one spot. So it's, in our experience, it's just not one thing's created equal. Right. You know, I mean, if they find a good, safe location like that, they will bed in it year-round. If they have enough factors surrounding it, you know, water, different food sources, does, that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, we yeah. call it primary bedding, but yep. I'm sure we all got that. Yeah, I like the in mind that we're thinking of. It's like, yep, it's a spot like that. You call it the buck nest? Yeah, I love it. That's <laughs> really nice. Awesome. That's my favorite. This next Good. question, this next question comes from Tyler Over and Katie Malone um, for Curtis. Uh, do you plan on using a kayak this year? If so, what is your setup on a <clears throat> plan with your kayak? Well, last year. I usually use a kayak a lot, actually, because 
I like the, the river access. Um, but last year we, we were targeted like for the most part one specific buck. So that area that we targeted, which was just a little overlooked chunk, um, we didn't have to use the kayak. So we actually didn't use the kayak last year, but um, this year I'm trying to stay away from trail cameras and like specific bucks and I just want to I just want to go after them and have some fun. So I'll be using a lot more of the kayaks this year. Um, my setup for the kayak is just $180 Viper from Menards. Yes. <laughs> it's a Viper. That's how we roll. <laughs> That's what I got. Like, yeah. <laughs> Black Friday sale. So. about you guys? When I float around a cottonwood log, <laughs> every now and then, <laughs> just passing by the house, all right, this is my trip. Jump on. <laughs> So, I mean, I don't know, there's probably some really nice setups out there. I don't know what the difference is. It probably <laughs> rides smoother or whatever. I don't know. But $180 kayak from Menards works for me. So Yeah, we use a, several different kinds of kayaks, and they vary in, in function and, and range of price. One I have is $450, and it's good enough to get the gear in and out, and it's, you know, it's not a fast kayak. Like, it doesn't track real well, but, you know, it's just kind of a cheaper model, but it, it gets the job done. Zach has a Jackson kayak. I believe that's a little bit heavier duty. Oh yeah, it's, it's like eleven hundred bucks. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a, a nice it's one, real deal. So if I put it on top of the Smurf, like it'll push the roof yeah. down. So what? Down. So <laughs> what would you say like the major differences between like a eleven hundred dollar kayak? And, like, you might be able to get a deer out on his. You, you could probably get a deer out on his. Oh, we've got a deer out on mine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Viper, man. Yeah. <laughs> you said you can get a deer. Oh out yeah. On we really? Yeah, I just threw it on the back. Got a shot on Oak Island. Nice, nice. I'd Island. like to see a picture of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, ours, a couple of our other ones are kind of small, like your perception or whatever. <clears throat> it's smaller. Yeah, it. you can't get gear out on that. But you know, my, I think my kayak's ten and a half footer. It's forty five pounds. It's easy to throw in and out. Zach's is probably an eighty to hundred pound kayak. Like it takes a little more effort to get that thrown up on top of the car in the back of the truck or something like that. So for for convenience, you know, a cheap cheaper kayak like it sounds like you're using and. You know, like the one that I use is yeah, just convenient for that's one I yeah. You you guys use kayaks quite a bit. Yeah, yeah we got like five or six more, of them, yeah. all different kinds of brands and stuff. But cool. Speaking of water access, um, I think you've said you you've got some hip waders. Have you used chest waders too at time to time? I'm guessing. Me, I just get wet. Yeah, 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 that's all right, but he goes down. Yeah. He drills yeah. holes in the bottom of his boots. Yeah, rubber boots. Water. So the water leaks out. <laughs> that's so smart, though. When you think about it. Oh, God. But yeah, I've, I've used, you know, from canoes to kayaks to, you know, regular just boats. But I have a, my, my ultimate one is uh, it's a little flatback uh, fiberglass canoe. And I'll, I'll you know, I'm gonna make a long trip up a channel or something like that. I'll throw a trolling motor on the back of that thing and I'll just freaking fly. You know, and cover a lot more ground, but on a shorter trip, if I can just use some chest waders or just a kayak, man, that's that's one of like the ultimate. Well, everything is access. You know, that's mm-hmm. kind of access, half the battle access. is that access from downwind sides or whatever you got to do or to get around the backside of them deer. Yeah. Talk about when you float up and then come back down. Oh yeah, yeah. So like with a with a motor. So if I got a boat and I'm going miles up the river, the big river in Missouri. Um, if I'm going to hunt a certain spot where I want to land the boat, and I'll usually have just a little trail trimmed out from the river because it's thicker than hell along the Missouri River, and I'll, uh, I'll trim a spot out to get to my stands, and it might only be 20 to 50 yards in. And uh, if I got a motorboat, and this is kind of maybe getting a little bit out of hand, most people probably just pull right up to the damn spot, I'll go up river, kill the motor, and float my way down a quarter mile. You know, especially in like an evening, because, you know, they're going to be bedded along that area. Right. I'm going to, so in an evening, they're going to be bedded along that river. So I'll just go up and I'll kill it up their ways and just silently float down using a trolling motor to guide mm-hmm. myself or something like mm-hmm. that. That's a good idea. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it works. It works awesome. At least I feel like it does. You know, I mean, it's all like when you know you made a good access to a spot, you know, you're practically like vibrating because you're like, this is going to be awesome. You just know you get that sure. feel. You know, and it seems like when you got that positive feel going, oh. get them vibes going, <laughs> you know, it, it's almost like them deer just feed off it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. really we like the kayaks just for the stability. stability. Like, I know when we first started using water access, Aaron, I mean, they, they were using an old canoe. I mean, there's some pretty 
Perry. So yeah, it was this ancient that. old fiberglass canoe that my neighbor had that just sat down by his pond forever. Aluminum, I believe, wasn't it? It might be aluminum. Um, <laughs> anyway. I, I think it is fiberglass. But either way, it's real old. We had to get it licensed and everything. He had to do that. And we went in on icy waters in the river and killed a buck. And coming out, the river was froze. I mean, all our tracks in were already froze, you know, our path in. So going out, there was two dudes and a buck and stands and everything in this canoe. And the thing's like this far out of the water on the way out of there. And it's just like, if you take a deep breath, it's going over you. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually been there. <laughs> yeah, you did say you did say clean access you know, yielded optimistic and positive results. Yeah, that day, we, we got to the stand and we're like, there's no way in hell after this just happened that we're going to see anything. Literally got in the stand and knocked an arrow and Zach, who was filming me, Zach Kurzieski, a different Zach, he said, hey, there's a shooter coming. Somebody let him, out of a, let him out of a cage or something right here? Like, looked down there and a buck came right in and we shot him and loaded him in the canoe. It was awesome. Never taken that canoe again, though, ever after that. I'm going to yeah, use the yak. Oh, yeah. We went in there and scouted six mile stretch of river, three of us in that canoe in the summer. Snakes and everything else and every deadfall. And this is a nasty, you know, Midwestern catfish creek. It's not, it is not free flowing. It's stagnant water the whole way. And yeah, we flipped it over a few times. Our Yeti. <laughs> no. That's why we prefer the kayaks. But. All right, this next question um, is again from Tyler and Katie Malone. Um, Greg, uh, when you um, head in, what does your filming setup look like? And how many cameras do you use? Uh, our filming setup has changed a little bit over the years, but uh, what we've been trying to do since we're trying to educate and show as much of the big picture as possible, uh, we rely on GoPros largely uh, when we're walking in, um, maybe if they've seen the shows uh, from last season, we'll attach it to a tree stand as the person is walking in. That way you can basically see what they're seeing. You know, they're, they're hopefully, you know, whatever they're pointing out, whatever they see, um, you know, gets shown. And then, so we rely on that. Also, we use basically a selfie style GoPro rig, um, kind of the same idea. Uh, you know, whatever person sees or is thinking as they're walking in, they're explaining it and able to show with the GoPro. It's, you know, they're super easy to run. The camera, you know, it's just a one press record. Um, you know, it's an automatic camera. You know, it's, it's not high-end videography, but for what we're trying to do um, to educate as much as possible and show as much of the process as possible, the GoPros uh, play a large part in that. And then our primary camera is like a Sony X80 or a Sony Z150, something like that without getting too technical i mean they shoot 4k they shoot you know high frame rate you have that option they have a one inch sensor so they're really good in low light so you're not missing any opportunities at deer that you know early in the morning or, or late in the evening okay great um our next question is for dan in the vault. um it comes from gary faith um he says i found a group of bucks on public land i'm watching right now meeting july I have watched a big one come into the field from the same direction a couple of times in the evening. Should I blast him there now and try and locate his specific bedding? He knows that bucks will disperse come velvet drop, but traditionally he's seen bucks come from the same area in previous falls. Do we, does he just continue to observe from afar, or does he go in there and, and, and get after it right now and try and find the bed? Well, if it were me, personally, I would... Uh not go in there now. I would uh, watch and wait and try to predict where they're betting and such. Uh, that betting is likely to change before season, at least slightly. Um, so I keep an eye on it and, and make an educated guess. However, that's me. And if you have some intel you need, go in there and get it. Get it and get out. Um, but otherwise, if you think you know how he's moving, you don't need no more. I mean, go in there and give it a shot and See what happens. Did they say when the opener was? I'm just curious, like how far away the season is. 
Um, no, he didn't. Yeah. yeah. He didn't mention that they had already had the intel then of like the scouting. Like he already knew the area. Yeah, I would say to frame the question maybe a different way is yeah, he knows the area. Typically, he's seen bucks coming to the field from what I'm gathering here um, in a specific area. Uh, I think what he's wondering is does he go in and try and find that bed in an effort to sure. develop a plan to get in between the bed and the food? Right. Well, I would say one thing, you know, if, like Dan said, I mean, this is going to vary depending on your comfort level with the spot, you know, but we scouted this time of year before and actually blown them out of there. I mean, full, full on go right in there, blow them out and went back, you know, two months later and they'd be right back in the same beds. You know, at, we call it the get out of jail free card. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, if you haven't went in, if you if you don't know exactly where they're at, or the almost, the, you know, the grove of trees that you want to set up in, or whatever, then we'll go in and get it. If we don't know. I mean, but that I, it probably depends on the deer, also, you know. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And that almost varies just as hunting style goes. You know, it depends on what you've got going. Is that a private section? Is that a public exactly. spot that you're going to depend on all year? Yep. You know, that type of thing. And, and with for myself, uh, I see a lot of the time with, with where I'm at is deer, we see a lot of bucks in a lot of weird spots right now because the mm -hmm. river comes up. It pushes them up out of them spots. And, and they, they could be there all the way up until August 26th and you know it opens the 31st of august or the first of september up there and so i've seen them change that last week from time to time so it all depends like what you got going if, if you got a lot of spots that hit and you, you can kind of spread you spread it out a little bit i take your time with it you know and uh try to just maximize your opportunity if that's your op if that's what you have available to you but if that's going to be one of your spots that like if you're going to your best shot is to kill that deer that early season instead if, if if you need that intel, go after it. If not, like lay back and see what happens. Because you could go in there and do a bunch of work, and they're gone. You know, they're yeah. just gone because they migrated. You know, so you're um, talking about them leaving or moving in the past the last five days of August. There, yeah, or even even the related mostly to the or mm -hmm. water levels. I mean, yeah, yeah, it could be anything. I mean, yeah. I've seen deer just leave, you know, one area, and I don't even know why. It's just a summer summer mm -hmm. ranging spot. Sure. You know, we, I've seen them move out of the river bottoms because the mosquitoes are so bad. I, I, I just, I know that's a thing because I'll see them come out and they'll just run. <laughs> they'll just run across the field as soon as they get out in the open. And they're just trying to find them spots and the mosquitoes are just, un, you know, torturing them. So I, I know that there's deer that move up into the, the higher ground out of the valley. And it's more grassy and prairie and kind of bluffs and badlands and pines and cedars. And so I'll see deer up there and they will be miles away from where they end up, you know, come season. So... It's, it's, like I said, it's kind of a, you know, what's your situation, you know? The bottom line is, it is if you need the intel, go in. But you have to step back and really think about it. Do I need it? Because I think a lot of people um, don't feel confident about themselves, and they go in when really where they go and look, that's where the buck is anyways. You know, and I think you got to just take a step back and say, do I need this intel or don't I? If you need it, go in and get it. But if you don't, you know, take an educated guess. Uh, and take a shot at it. I think sometimes you got to look at what your goals are. I, I'm very goal oriented. So, like when I first started hunting around here, getting to know the area, this time of year I would be out running 20 cameras, moving them around every week, and just putting too much pressure on. Now, as I've gotten older, I wait longer and longer each year to set my stands. Like, I see a lot of guys go out and they hang tons and tons of stands this time of year. To me, I want to hang stands when I have the intel. And, like, that fall, early fall intel is when I really start hanging my tree stands and stuff because that's when the bucks move in. And I have no problem going in and blowing an area out if I know I'm not going to be hunting for a few weeks. Uh, even if, even for Walter Payton last year, I, as soon as I knew he was there, I'm like, I knew I needed to get a couple stands just before the rut. So I just go in there and blow it out. But um, I also use my ATV and keep the ATV running and try to sell it like a farmer where you guys are in a little different situation because you're hunting public land. So... Uh, yeah, but I would say the comparison there is you're probably only going in once. Yes. And you're taking care of everything in one trip. Yep, yep. Like yep. if it's, it's that repetitive pressure that occurs over and over again in a specific location that yep, they start correct. to catch on to. you got to remember that uh, coyotes and crap run them out of their beds too. Yeah. I mean, that's just as much a threat as we are. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of, like you said, the repetitive. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to ask Dan, over the years of 
as you've learned more about white tail behavior, especially buck bedding behavior, have you found that you scout less than what you used to uh, Yeah, that's yeah. correct. I mean, I think I could look at a property and, and know it a lot better than I could years ago. Mm-hmm. And I got that confidence that when I see something, I know what's going on. That's why I'm trying to be careful how I answer stuff in that I might do something that doesn't necessarily mean that that's how the guy listening to me should do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but yeah, uh, the more you do this, the better you get at it. Okay, our next question comes from <laughs> Billy Floyd. Billy wants to know uh, from Dan Infault, um, he's referring to our podcast together, Dan, where we talked a little bit about ozonics, and you said that, uh, I don't know that you said you were on the fence, that's the way the, the question is framed. Um, so Jason mentioned that Dan was on the fence about ozonics. Um, can you please, Dan, expand on that? Is Jason trying to push buttons? <laughs> uh, out of all the methods of scent control, I believe Ozonics has got the best chance of blocking your scent. I do think that it needs to be a little controlled, um, but I haven't tested it, so I can't say that for sure. To me personally, uh, I would rather get a deer without the scent control. I think it's more the one-on-one type hunting, um, but I don't, I don't really believe in any of it in the open environment. Sure, fair enough. All right, this next question is for Scott. Scott, uh, Richard Schumann says, what would be the best advice that you could give to someone hunting a high-pressured public hunting area that produces at least one, if not two, giants every year during the first two weeks of the season? Are these guys basically, he goes on to say, are these guys getting lucky or is there actually a science behind it? Is it, is it, is there anything that you could, uh, is there anything that you could say that uh, pushes um, those deer? For, for the early season box, right? Yep. Yeah. I, I, I just, I get in early season and, you know, I do a lot of my camera work and try to find these big deer. Um, I don't go in too much, like once a month I might, you know, go in, try to go in with the wind, check my camera, just try to, and I build history with some of these old bucks. I've had bucks on public land for three, four, five years, a couple of them, pictures of them, you know, eight-year-old buck, I got an eight-year-old buck now I've been watching for a while, and just, just kind of get to know their patterns, where they bed. And if you, like that one I got a few years ago, it, it was, a, usually I wouldn't hunt the mornings, but it was, it was October 3rd, we had a heck of a cold front coming in, it was, it was below 30 degrees out that morning, so I kind of snuck up the creek, kind of went in the back way up to the, to the finger going up the ridge, and, um, you know, he was running late to his bed, it was cold that morning, and, and he come right up the finger, and, and got him, um, you know, 25 yards away, come up, just browsing his way through. Mm-hmm. And normally I went hot mornings in the early season, but it was just the opportunity. It was cold that morning. Um, I think, you know, when it's cold, it has some big ones on their feet later. Um, that's the thing about the early season. They're just, you can, you can um, pattern them a lot better. And then, and then, if you can get out of a big one, pattern them. You know, after after a couple of weeks, they catch on to that pressure, and in come the rut. You know, your your the big ones are just scattered all over the place. But yeah, if you can get out of them, yeah, I mean, it's hard to hunt a specific buck in the rut. Um, I'm more of a specific buck people, a person. A lot of these guys, you know, I'm all like they they go in. You know, just mature deer. But <laughs> I, I find specific deer, and, and but I won't go after one certain one. You know, I'll, multiple areas. I'll, I'll put cameras, build history with them, um, and I'm opportunist. If that big one I'm hunting, if another good mature buck that looks good walks in, you know, he's going to get an arrow just as well. You know, but. My intention is I find this big deer and I go in kind of after them. And I, and I prefer, like I've had a couple areas where there's two or three old mature deer where it kind of ups my odds to 
to see at least one of them big ones, you know. Um, I've had areas not many deer, and there's just one big one in there. I kind of try to sit, lean away from that just because, you know, I'll, I'll pick an area with more mature deer. But um, I guess some early season deer, you just, you just pattern them and get on them before pressure hits and get to learn them. I think if I heard that correct, he was kind of alluding to why the bucks were there early season and this heavy pressure, and if that was a fluke? Yeah, essentially, are, are these guys just getting lucky, or is there some method to the madness? Well, to me, there's there's no flukes with big bucks. They're doing something for a reason. And those mature bucks, if they're there, they live there. So they're just not getting shot at other times of the year, basically. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. All right, the next question, um, I'm going to ask all of you to answer this. Uh, we'll start with Lucas, if that's okay. Yep. Um, it comes from Alan Vincent. When do uh, the public land guys decide the time frame to hunt specific topo with grounds that they're hunting if they don't have cameras up? Um, do, you, do you start with hills, farm, or marsh? And I realize that it may or may not pertain to some of you, but uh, how, how do you decide when it is you're going to hunt what kind of terrain? Whenever I locate a big buck there. <laughs> That's literally it. I mean, like I said, I use the river a lot, and uh, when the when the water is up high and it can come up high in the fall, sometimes it just depends. And uh, you know, if we get some early snowfall or something in the mountains, and that melts off, and the river is going to come up, or the dam, Fort Peck, they let out water, that can bring up some areas. So you know, ge geographically speaking, if, if some of them low lying areas are, are filling up with water, I have, I don't know. 30, 40 different spots come to mind where it creates pinch points at certain levels of when the water comes up because it'll back feed into areas and that'll, that'll cut off hundreds and hundreds of yards of, of different travel areas for them deer. And, and I know those areas now. I've hunted there for, since I was 12. You know, I'm 29 now. So I've got a lot of just in the back of my mind just based off of water levels is kind of the thing that I feed off of. You know, and that's kind of how I base a lot of my hunting is, is what's accessible right now and what isn't. And and that could go as, as much as, well, now I can canoe to an area that I'd normally have to walk through swamp mud that's knee, to, knee high to waist deep that you're never going to get through. Now I can skim across that thing. Except for that. get through it. <laughs> yeah, 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 you can swim through it. You can pop up. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody sees him and they're like, I saw Sasquatch. <laughs> but, uh, you know, geographically speaking, like that, you know, I, I play a lot off the water and, and uh, I like to hunt mainly really flat ground along the river and there's hillsides up on, on each side of the valley. And, uh, I sometimes like to get up above that stuff on where we're at river bottoms meeting meeting up to that that the bluffs on the side of the of the valley. And so I can get up top and just glass from that stuff. And uh, I, that's worked a lot of times. I've got one spot in particular where if you go out when all the leaves are gone and you sit up above this 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 big, big it's like it's half kind of swampy cattails mixed with cottonwoods and willow bar and stuff like that, and it kind of makes a big horseshoe shape. And uh, you can set up above that and really learn about just the movement of the deer. I've done that a lot of times, just not even having a tag in my pocket, just going and sitting up there and watching how they're moving. And I can almost, and you can pick out a buck bedded down in there, you know. And we've done that ju just to pick it out and go after him, just on, on the ground, you know, or where he's bedded. Well, they usually get up from that point and they work this this little little pocket of really thick willows and then you can catch them in the little spot where they drop through a little drainage coming from the river you got your lane to shoot them right when they drop down into that so there's you know it's unlimited out there obviously it's keep your mind open you know and and, and once you see something if it even if it sounds dumb or it doesn't seem likely i always everything's on the table in this in this game it seems like so you probably said it already but what part of north dakota is that roughly northwest northwest yeah severe northwest I live literally a mile, like a mile and a half from the border of Montana. Nice. Yeah. You can see Montana. I can see Montana from my house. That's just why I hunt there a lot. <laughs> uh, for me, I guess being from northeastern Wisconsin, we don't have much hills. So, I mean, early season, if you're, it's probably like a two-hour drive to get to some hills, hour and a half, two hours. Um, 
So I'm usually hunting like swamps and cattails and stuff, focusing on specific beds and bedding areas. And then um, that's early in the season. And then once the rut kicks in, we kind of transition over to the western part of the state where there's a bunch of hills and stuff for the rut. So early on, I usually hunt fields, hunt more food sources, and then work my way basically back into the timber. But I'm always hunting usually individual animals, and many, many, many years ago, I've kind of come to the realization that you can't go on to just uh, any piece of ground and expect to kill, you know, a big Pope and Young or a Boone and Crockett animal. They have to be there first. So that's why I moved from Michigan, eventually started hunting more in Illinois. That's half the battle. I think a lot of guys spend and waste a lot of the hours on stand in areas that are just not productive, thinking that time in the stand is the secret. And I'm here to tell you, like, I'm very impatient. And Andre, who was a big mentor of mine growing up, he's the most impatient hunter I ever met. He was the first one back to camp in the morning, the last one to leave in the afternoon. And he killed the biggest deer because he was in the right spot at the right time. So I think a lot of guys waste a lot of time hunting in, in unproductive areas when they should probably be moving on um, and in some way giving up because you're just not going to succeed in a, in a bad area, basically. So for me, there's a system to uh, to where I'm hunting time frame away, time frame wise, and that would be early season. I'm hunting swamps and marshes uh, because the method behind that is that those bucks uh, will move the distance in that early season where I can kill them and I can get within 50, 75 yards of those beds because of the thickness. Because those are usually uh, uh, not vision related bedding; they're in little thick holes. And I can get real close and kill them. So that early season, I'm in marshes and swamps. And then come rut, I like hill country. And I like hill country because you can read it like a map, the leeward ridges, and you can kind of cross out everything that's not leeward. And you can get right in there tight against uh, presumed bedding. And it's really easy to get on bucks and rut in hill country. Uh, late season, I like farm country. And the reason I like farm country late season is because those bucks, if you're on the right property, all congregate in one spot, and it can get real easy. Good answer. Good answer. Yeah. Good answer, Dano. Nice. Uh, I would say that all of our strategy, regardless of the time of the year, revolves around observation more so than anything else, uh, especially if we're hunting a lot of new areas. We, it, to your point, like during the early season, we'd probably prefer to hunt some sort of flatter type terrain, whether it's swamp, but also farmland. Um, Anywhere where we can get up high and visually look in from a distance and potentially catch a buck getting up out of a bedding area is one that we would take pretty seriously early season like that. That's where we tend to be. And we don't hunt the hills as much early just because it seems like the vegetation is always so much thicker in there during that time. You can't see near as far. Like you have to guess exactly right, and you may have five points coming off a ridge that could all set up great for buck bedding. And try to get them to move away from the acorns. Right. Yeah, and the wind is more of a challenge in there too. So it seems like when the leaves come off of that and when you get closer towards the rut that that type of terrain tends to get a little bit easier. But regarding then late season, I mean, it kind of goes back into the observation game again where we're trying to find bucks in almost in an obscure food source because in our area there isn't a ton of, believe it or not, a ton of ag land in the public areas that we hunt that you can target during the late season. So they, do, you, do you guys, like in the summer, do you guys do uh, a lot of glassing, velvet type stuff? Do you run trail cameras? How do you, how do you locate your animals that you're going to go after? We don't. The above. Yeah, okay. I mean, probably not much different than everybody else. But it, it just seems like the, the places where we had the best success, especially, for example, in Iowa in early October, we have had a lot of success in at least seeing mature bucks. I wouldn't say necessarily killing them. You know, seeing them and killing them is a totally different story. But we do see a lot of daylight mature buck movement in the first half of October. And I think that's because we're doing a lot of observation sits in these areas. And like you said, many of them are in swamp but some of them are also in farmland. Uh, anywhere where it's flat where we can get up high and get a look in there and then, and then make a move from that point forward to try to get in there super tight to the beds. Yeah, I mean, my answer would mirror Aaron's because we basically hunt together all fall as a group. But 
geographically speaking, I guess, which is a little bit off topic. Um, you know, we talked about going on a whitetail, public land whitetail tour this fall. Public land deer tour. We might shoot a daily at some point. Sorry, That'd be deer tour. There you go. <laughs> oh, boy. I love, I love going west. Yeah. I love the west for so many different reasons. North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska. I mean, I'm already, I can't wait to get in a kayak and be going down a river somewhere in western Nebraska here in another five or six weeks. I mean, it's coming up fast. North Dakota, the same. Yeah. The August, August, so anyways, yeah, I, mean, I love the West. Um, Aaron's talking about going to Kentucky early in the season, possibly. Yeah, slinging one down there, maybe. That'd be nice. So, But it's it's kind of rolling t- terrain down there, but it, the area that we're looking at is more marshy mix uh, where, and that's by design. It's because we Figured there's more deer in that area in general, so it'd be easier for us to find something having never been there before, and it's an area that we could potentially observe when we're on limited time on a new property, for example. Yeah, so we'll be back in Hunt, Iowa, Missouri for the rut, and then probably going to go somewhere south in December or January. Yeah, we'll get in Alabama in January. Yep. I'm jealous. You've been there on the road, man. That'd be fun. There's on peanut butter sandwich. Shoot spike butts and the ice cream bar. I guess I'm kind of like Lucas. I, whatever kind of intel I pick up on my camera and look, and that's, that's where I try to hone in on the bucks. Um, early season, I guess typically it would be closer to bedding areas because some big deer won't move far from their bedding areas at all. In the, you know, they'll get up. Maybe go to a food source, acorn. You know, if acorns are dropping, you they won't they won't go far at all from their bedding areas. So, I, I'm hunting more in hill country. So, I mean, public most of my stuff is hills if it's early season. You know, not too many field edges. Um, so I guess you know, I'm just you know, with that buck you were talking about a while ago came early season in the hills. So yeah, he came. You know, even though we're saying that we don't necessarily hunt the hills that much yeah. early. It's obvious that yeah. you can kill them. He came out of but he came out of some private cornfields down below to the to the north, I guess. And that's what I knew he'd be feeding down in the cornfields. It was cold that morning. Mm-hmm. And then he kind of meandered through a creek, old cattle pasture type um, bottom that was all growed up. And then he came up one of them fingers heading up into the hills. But... Um, and then, you know, he was bedding just right up. He was probably bedding within 100 yards of where I was sitting. But So basically, you know, that's how I hunt early season. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, question again for all of you. Um, this comes from uh, John McComas. Uh, what's your most memorable public land hunt, whether you shot a giant or not? Ball gun doesn't matter. Hmm. That's a tough one. Wow. Dang. Scott? I don't know. I got so many. I mean, every, everyone, everyone is memorable in his own way. I, I guess that one I talked about early, earlier, the early season bucket was so memorable because I shot him early season. And, but I've already told that story. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess my second memorable is... I'm a, primarily a bow hunter, but here in Iowa we have an early muzzleloader season, and that's actually pretty middle of. That's actually the October law, the you know the myth of. I mean, it's not a myth, but they do. They them big bucks are still on their feet, but um, you have to be right on top of their bedding area for that too. And, and this buck, um, I had a lot of pictures of him. It was a public piece. Uh, it was along a river. I had to use hip waders to get across this river. That's a spot I've, I've killed quite a few good deer in. And it kind of eliminates. It's, it's too shallow for really a kayak most times a year. But, you know, you can put hip waders on. Everybody's back on this side of the park, you know. And, and I go back into the good areas. And that was another case where a cold front was coming. And I was sitting on the edge of a cedar thicket. And... Um, it was probably early muzzle season. I had my muzzle loader, and probably five o'clock. It was pretty early, it, it, middle of October. And then early muzzle season can either, you know, be horrible or really good if a cold front comes in. It, it was probably October seventeenth, twentieth, and a cold front was blasting in that in that night. We had you know some light rain. It was probably 
70 degrees most of the week. I think it was Wednesday or Thursday. The muzzle season was from Saturday to Sunday. And I'm sitting there about 5 o'clock, I think quarter after 5. Here he comes, a 170-inch um, nine-point come out of cedar thicket. And he was heading to the, he was cutting out of the public land, heading to a cornfield off the distance that was on private. And probably gave me a 40, 50-yard shot. And, you know, I, I collect the intel off cameras. Another thing, I had two, three good mature bucks in that same, you know, in that same few hundred-yard area. And, um, yeah. Came by and did 40, 50 yard shot. He, he yeah. went down. It was a pretty exciting moment for, you know, I'm primarily a bull hunter, but just the way that all played together for multiple season was great. Uh, got a lot of memorable ones as well, but probably one sticks out of my mind is my first year. It was, uh, it was just a doe, um, but probably it was 1995. My first year of bow hunting, I was 14 years old, and it was memorable for a lot of reasons. But, you know, I, I grew up reading all the magazines, and this one article stuck out to me. I think it was called Watch Dogs of the Woods. And I remember just trying to soak up all the information I could when I was young. And this article was about how squirrels and blue jays and stuff will sometimes signal like a deer is approaching, like blue jay squawking and a deer or squirrel or something like that. So, anyways, uh, on stand, I heard a blue jay just going nuts. Back towards the bedding area, so I thought, well, I better get my bow and stand up and be ready. And sure enough, 30 seconds later, here comes the doe, walks right up to the trail, eight-yard broadside shot, you know, put a perfect shot on her. She does a big mule kick and runs off. So, you know, for your first year, I mean, that's always just super exciting. We're just ecstatic. My dad was in another stand 50 yards away from me. You know, got down, went, told him about it, so we're all excited. And then this public land is divided. There's a road that goes down the middle. It separated, separates Iowa and Nebraska land. So there's deer ran back across that line. So you have to have a game warden to cross onto what is technically Iowa land. Anyway, so we go back to the parking lot. And one of our, our friends is there. And I'm telling him the story. He was a real shy kid. And he's you know, asking me all these details. I said, oh, yeah, I got one. You know, he was, he was just real excited, high-fiving me. And anyways, the game warden comes, we go in and get the deer. It takes probably an hour. Get back to the parking lot, my buddy is still there, and who's become a real good family friend of ours, and he's still there because he just he wanted to see the doe, you know, shake my hand and congratulate me there with my first deer. And I thought that was really special that someone would, you know, wait an hour just to see, you know, this kid come out with his first deer with the doe. So that was essentially within my first week of hunting on public land. So I had a lot of positive experiences over the years, making friends, meeting people like that on public land. It was really heavily hunted land. You know, there'd be guys, you know, spread out all across uh, the public land. You know, here in Iowa where we hunt, we rarely run into somebody there. It was, there was always somebody hunting there. So anyways, um, yeah, rambling on. But it was it was pretty special to shoot your first year and have somebody be that excited Definitely. for you. So that's, mm-hmm. and that's been one of our favorite things over the years. Um, real quick, maybe a second one of the most memorable hunts that we've had is when Aaron and I hunted together a couple of seasons ago. He shot a, a big doe with his grandfather's, his late grandfather's old muzzleloader. Oh, yeah, that old muzzleloader. So a couple of my most memorable hunts don't revolve around a bunch of inches of antler. It's around, yeah. uh, you know, meaning and, and friendships. and Definitely. So, yeah. Yeah, that's probably my most memorable one, uh, other than the time that you and I were hunting the yeah. same buck. That was in the same bedding area at the same time. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Anyway, me and Buckley are after this one huge deer, and we call each other, and we're like, yeah, where are you going? Where are you going? Either way, we ended up, one of us was on one side of the bedding area, and one of us was on the other side of the bedding area. But uh, the buck nest was a really cool hunt because it validated our severe suspicions at the time that this buck bedding thing was not just a bunch of hocus pocus mm-hmm. like at the time we were doing a ton of research into it and it was all making total sense but we're and this is a few years ago you know but we're still like i mean my boss at the time was just saying like there's no way that this is this is any good and like everybody else is looking at me cross-eyed like what are you talking about you know you're gonna go in there and shoot a, a set up 40 yards from a buck in his bed and kill him and we went in that night and watched 15 bucks stand up out of this, the bedding wow. area that we were wow. targeting on public, and four of them were mature bucks. Wow. Yeah. Cool. The buck nest. Yeah, the buck nest. <laughs> I like it. And then I started listening to you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
I was going to say my most memorable hunt was a button buck fawn. I shot when I was nine. Oh, wait, I couldn't hunt when I was nine. Twelve. Let's say twelve. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll skip that story because he stole it from me. <laughs> here, <laughs> the small book. Here, but uh, I guess my uh, my favorite uh, public land hunt would be the Rome Legend buck. Uh, that buck was shot about five, six years ago, I think. Um, but that buck was a buck that everybody in town was after. And I guess one of my uh, secret passions is outdoing everybody on equal ground. I really That's what I like about public land. Mm-hmm. So anybody can hunt there. And everybody was seeing this buck, and everybody in town was talking about it, and it was right in my back door, you know. And that's a pretty heavily hunted, pressured property. So I started looking for the buck, found it uh, through glassing, and by me, you can shine. And uh, my first hunt for him, he was bedded a little off because he bedded with a doe, and I had to walk through doe bedding to get to the primary bedding, and I kicked him out of the area. Uh, and almost got him, actually, on a bump and dump because I split the doe in the buck and set up there. But he circled way downwind and, and busted me when he came back looking for the doe. But then he moved off the public land, and he was living on some private land that's uh, uh, an outfitting operation against the public. And uh, I'd watch him and, and wait. And the next year came around, and I had real good suspicions he'd show back up by the does in that uh, bedding area again. And I was just monitoring, and uh, pretty soon I started hearing rumors around town, so I went and checked, and the rub line coming out of that bedding area was opened up and it had chest-high rubs. And I was like, okay, I think he's back, you know, and, and all these scrapes and stuff showed up and rubs all over the place. And when I went in to hunt him for the first time that year, it was Halloween day. And there was guys everywhere. I had to walk past like 10 guys. And some of them were getting mad at me, but I had to get by them to get to where I wanted to be. And uh, some of them were as close as 200 yards to that buck bedding area. And uh, I got in there and I set up. And I was pretty sure I even knew, you know, out of 20 beds in there, which one he'd be in based on the wind. And I was staring at the spot when he stood up. And I, I mean, that was just... I don't know how to say it, but it's kind of surreal when you're hunting that buck and you're taking a guess at what day he's going to be there, and it's the first day you hunt him. And that buck got up and walked straight to me, and I shot him. And I was 75 yards from his bed, I think. And when I shot him underneath me, it was closing time. Wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, what chance does one of those guys got? That's peak right over by me, Halloween night. What chance does one of those guys got 200 yards back? None. Mm-hmm. Right. But that was probably my favorite uh, big buck on the public. How quickly did he cover that 75 yards? It took him quite a while. Yeah. Uh, it's not as fast as what people would think. And it's kind of nerve-wracking uh, staring at this thing coming at you, you know, slow. And especially when they look up, because eventually they look in your direction. And you, you get this idea they're looking right at you. Like they see you, but they really don't. You know, and uh, it was probably, I want to say 30 minutes. Oh. Yeah, buddy. My most memorable uh, was a, a doe fawn my first year ever on public with a bow when I was 15, I think. But that's the uh, best one I got. Heck yeah. Well, I got a bunch of memorable hunts that didn't all end in a kill, but um, I think the most memorable one is when I was hunting public land down in Missouri. I drove down there, I ended up tagging out in Wisconsin, so I got a Missouri tag, and <clears throat> I'd drive down there every weekend, and pretty much what I did was I went down there, and I just, like, aggressively scouted and walked through a bunch of bedding areas and just tried to kick up as most doles as possible, and then I kind of wanted to, you know, figure out those bedding areas. So then, <clears throat> I, uh, my third weekend, or you know, it was the third weekend down there. It was like a six or seven hour drive from my place. So I'd get done working for the week and we would drive. I'd drive down there by myself, sleep in the parking lot, hunt for three days and drive back for work. So um, it was like the third weekend there. It was just like a real cold morning up on this ridge. Like I think Missouri is one of the, my favorite places to hunt because I don't know, it's just so... The Rolling Hills is yeah. just beautiful. Beautiful dude from Missouri. Yeah. yeah. And I love it. And uh, so I was up on this ridge, and it was just a two-year-old buck, but it was freaking awesome, man. Like, some doles came in, and I, I crossed the sun trail, or I crossed the trail that I wanted to shoot to, 
because I couldn't find my tree. And I was all pissed off about that. I was sweating. It was like a two mile walk in. I was like, <laughs> whatever. Got up in my tree, and I, the, sure enough, the doe was coming in. It's like eight in the morning, and you can just see like the everything was. It was like October twenty third, I think. And so all the all the leaves were orange and yellow and colorful, and the doe's these doe's came in and hit my scent trail. I'm like exactly what I thought was going to happen. I'm just sitting here pissed off, you know, they're going to be blowing and whatever. And then all of a sudden they're like staring to my left and here comes that buck. And he ended up coming in. She ended up blowing and like jumping off, but he ended up coming in at like 20 yards and I shot him. Uh, it, and it was just like an all day thing. It took me until I shot him at like 8.30 and I, I got him back at the truck at like 7.30 at night and it was I mean I was like dead beat tired and I had a six hour drive back home and it was on a Sunday of course <laughs> but it was Always that, just, I think like the most the most work and stuff you put into something man it just that was the first time out of state for me and it was just I don't know I'll never forget that nice yeah I guess for me it's, it's not even a deer that I killed uh, I told you guys this view this story uh, this past November, um, I got a buddy of mine, Colin Barry. Uh, he's pretty new in the bow hunting, and uh, this will be his like third year of going hard this year. And uh, I, I met him because I met him in the gym in, in the little town of Trenton, North Dakota. And I, but I had been seeing him hunting in an area in the spot where he was parking and everything. It was like that guy is never going to kill a deer. Like, uh, I saw him but he has a welding truck. He's a welder, and so uh, I met him. I, his, his truck was at the gym, and I was like, "Hey, you're the guy that's been hunting that down on that ditch bank road." And, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, man. It's this is tough stuff. He's from Missouri. Yeah, and uh, he's up there working in the oil fields." And so uh, I got to talking with him, and, and I, I told him, "I, you know." what do you think about filming and stuff like that? And he's like, oh, man, I want to get into that stuff, you know. And he's, he's two years older than me, so he's 31. And so he's really been wanting to get into it. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. You come and film with me a few times here and there and stuff. I'll, I'll trade you showing you how to hunt this place, you know. And so we just, just hit it off, started becoming we became good buddies and still are. And, and uh, so this past year, I took him to a spot uh, kind of right off – one of it was one of those situations where there was high ground. This is basically a bluff country going down in the valley, and you can see everything moving around down below you. And I knew that spot was, it's just all tall CRP and willows, and you can see down into it. But when you get down in there, you can't see shit. And so I said, we got to go get set up where we can look out over all this CRP. And this is right around the same time rifle season, I think, was, was either right before, I think it went right before season, uh, uh, no, it was right during, yeah. What the hell am I talking about? It was right during rifle season. So this place is just getting hammered all around everywhere, all the good spots, the, the timber line, and, you know, all the spots that are easy to access. And then we were kind of struggling finding the deer, and then I was just like, dude, let's go try something out of the ordinary. Let's go to this one spot. And I said, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a pile of deer in there. And we got, like, Andre and Chris, I was telling, telling uh, Todd about it, is breakneck height and tree. You know, you walk up and you're like, whoa. And so I said, we're going to get super high in this tree out here. We're going to overlook all this CRP. And we got super high up in there, and it was barely breaking light, and there was just deer everywhere. I mean, we were picking out bucks here and there and there. And finally, I seen the nice four-and-a-half-year-old, five-by-five, just cruising hard. I mean, and he was on the go. I mean, he was going from deer to deer. He'd spot one, he'd run over to it. It was a little buck, and he'd mow around with him a little bit, piss him off, and run him off. And then he would go on to another one. Well, he kind of came past us at about 150 yards, and uh, I kind of stopped running at him, but just just to try something at him because he was in that mode, and I I kind of thought at the time that like there's no way I can get that deer to come over here because um, he had his he was had his sights set on a deer out in a little small grassy area, and uh, as I, as he's heading over to that deer, it just dawned on me I was like he's he's in that mode I can rattle this deer in. It just hit me right there. I, so I said, Colin, take the camera. I was filming for him. And I gave him the camera. And I'm glad he had the wherewithal to, to film this. Because as soon as he, I hit the horns, and he's literally on a track. He's heading away from us. He checked that deer out, and he was leaving. He was 600, 500, 600 yards away. 
And I hit them horns as hard and loud as I could. And we're in kind of a clump brush. Well, he can't see in there. And I thought, this is the perfect scenario. This is it. This is it. I hit them horns, and he just, boosh, walked around, turned around, headed to the tree line instantly, and came straight to the base of the tree from 600 yards. Well, my buddy's a new runner. <laughs> this thing is going down, and I'm shaking, you know, because I like, you don't do that very often. You don't see it very often. And so I'm, I, he finally hands me the camera. I'm like, he's coming, dude. He's coming. Get ready. And it probably didn't help that I got so damn excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he fed right off of it. And we're in this tree, literally, like, that big. And so it's just vibrating. And I'm like, dude, you got to chill out. you got to chill out. you got to chill out. And then the tree is just shaking. I'm trying to video this deer coming in, and my camera is just, you know, like, just going nuts. And then he's like, I can't stop my leg, dude. He's like, I can't stop my leg. And he had the one, and he's, I call him a shaky leg, because he gets one leg that just goes nuts. Yeah, I've had that happen, too. One that's yeah. is uncontrollable. Yeah, I've been there. I've done it. Well, he's coming, and fine, he comes to about eight yards, and he's jumping over logs, and I mean grunting, and he comes right in, perfect footage and everything, and he, I see him draw back, because I'm telling him, like, draw, 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 he's getting in too close, and so he draws, and that deer comes in, and he doesn't shoot, and the deer finally skylines us, because he's finally like, right there, I mean, we're big blob in this little tree, you know, yeah. and we're in trees there, but there was just no foliage or nothing, he'd pick us off, no problem, but... That deer wheels, because he kind of glanced up, and he's seen us, turned wheels, and he, and he literally walked a 30-yard radius around us, trying to get down downwind of us. And I was like, oh, we're still going to kill this deer, you know, he's 30 yards out, and he's going to get into a pocket. Doesn't get into a nice pocket, this deer gets away. We, <laughs> my buddy was so sick, I said, he's, he's puts the bow down, and, I, and that deer's kind of leaving, and I was like, what happened, dude? I don't, I don't know. He drew back, well, blacked out, doesn't even know what happened. <laughs> he, he, he literally, to this day, is like, I thought I shot you. <laughs> he, he's like, I thought I shot. And I was like, clearly you didn't. <laughs> so so this, deer, this, this story just continued. So we watched that deer go out, gets uh, hooked up with a few does, breeds a doe, and then moves on to another doe. And we kind of lost sight of him. But we could tell he was still out in this area. And so I was like, well, let's climb down. Let's go over to this other tree. There was a big leaning tree leaning way out. And I was like, I'm going to go climb that freaking thing because it's, it's a nice slant. I could just crawl up the thing and get 30 feet up in the air and look over there. And I get up there, and I'm like, dude, there he is. He's bedded with a doe. And it was just, like, kind of calm. And I was like, man, can we sneak up on him? I don't know if we can. And then I was just like, well, dude, what do you think of this? My wife had a rifle take. And we've been hunting hard with her and trying to get her a deer. I was like, how about me and, me and Jen go get, we'll get the rifle tag, we'll come back here. We'll, we'll, we'll crawl out there. We'll try to kill this thing, me and Jen. And you sit on the backside of the exit route, because we had a stand back there where, where if we kick anything out of there, it's going to that spot. So it was like maximizing opportunity to kill this deer or any other deer that was out there. So he's like, hell yeah, dude, hell yeah. I kind of blew that anyways. <laughs> he said, so he was game. So I get my wife and told her the game plan. We got back down there about two hours later, and uh, which I figured he was going to hang there because there was bucks kind of all over, and he kept running them off, and he was just going to be there. And so I got back to that same leaning tree, crawled up there, and uh, spotted him right away. And then lost him about five minutes into watching him. So I was like, all right, he's there. Let's go. And my buddies posted up across the, the CRP on, on, on like a timber line where they would exit that. And uh, he filmed from that angle, and I had my camera and everything in GoPros. So we got a video of, of, of us coming out there, and we, what we didn't know is when we crawled through all that CRP, there was deer all over that we didn't even see. And he's got video of bucks fighting, like, in the foreground of us crawling, and he's got deer in the background. It was just a crazy hunt. Like, it was like, this should never happen. And when we got out there, I couldn't find him. I, I got out to where he was, and I was kind of peeking up and stuff and couldn't see him anywhere. And... Finally, just literally last last light, I, I said, well, let's just pretty much get up high and we'll just gamble. Hopefully we'll spot him before he sees us and we'll shoot something. And uh, I literally looked to my left and here he was walking right at us because there was a little buck that we didn't see right back behind us. And he was going towards that deer. And I got my wife, I told my wife, I was like, swing your gun over, just take a shot, you know. He's going to see us before, he, you know, anyways. So she swung over, about 40 yards, dropped him. And it was like... 
Yeah. This should have never happened. <laughs> this is one of those things, man. Like, I, I like that. Like you, I like the competition of like trying to outdo anybody else that's out there. It's, that's I, I don't know. I think most people have that in them if you're if you're serious about it, you know. And it it's just it's not something that they're necessarily going to like constantly weigh yourself versus everybody you know and go like well he kills more and I must suck it's it's, 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 it's kind of like it's just it's just fun it's right. fun to just I'm a competitive guy through sports and all that stuff so I have that competitive side and, and it's fun to just do the, the impossible almost you know so you got five yeah. minutes for one more story one more sure okay <laughs> quick one um, memorable hunts my daughter and my son's um, experience my daughter's first It'd be her second buck kill. The first one was a bow. I took her back into a public peak, same one where I killed across that river. And we got in there in the morning. It was her first buck kill. Yeah, we got into this stand. And I took a, I had a stand up there, but I took a second stand in for me to sit. And we got up. It was it was foggy that morning, just barely breaking light. And my dog, we, we're just setting down. We're getting stuff out of our packs, getting organized in this skinny little elm tree, you know. And, and it was a pinch point on a dike between two waterways. And um, um, she goes, "Dad, here comes a buck." And I said, "Oh wow!" I look, and here he comes through the fog, you know, coming right into it. So we were. You know, usually we like standing up and ready. I mean, we were caught off guard. It, it was barely light. And that thing came in, I'd say, 10 feet away, slammed on the brakes, looked up in the tree and spotted us both, and we're like, oh, no. And then some bucks were, you know, just immediately bolt be gone. He was one of the bucks that kind of just did the side step, like he, like he was going to try sneaking out of there. He was kind of backing up a little bit, unsure. And, I mean, my daughter had only killed a couple deer in her life and she was just on cue she stood up when that deer kind of turned his head a little bit stood up and just it was slowly backing off and i i grunted and she put the pin on it and 150 inch 10 point <laughs> we, she nailed it right through long as we watched it run probably 70 yards and we watched it fall down you talk about proud parent you know oh, a big deer like that it was just and she was only 18 years old 20 maybe and then my son He's killed a couple bucks. I wasn't with him, but hit the bear hunt we went on this spring, I was with him when he shot a bear up in Saskatchewan. I had already filled my tag, and this bear had come in three different times, big boar. And the first time, he he, he was pretty shook up, you know, the <laughs> bear fever going on. Just, but, you know, he was waiting for it to stop, and it move, and I told him, just take your time. Then the thing disappeared. And I said, well, maybe he'll come back, huh? Hour later, he come back, couldn't get a shot again. The third time he came in, like probably two hours that first time, he came in and 18 yards, it stopped. And Goaty pulled back and um, drilled him right through the lungs. We watched him kind of run around us. We went and seen him go off the hill, and I know we heard the, the death moan. And yeah, it was a pretty exciting just watching my kids, you know, being yeah. with them on a couple of them hunts is just yeah. something that you'd never experience or out-of-body experience, I guess. It's, it's pretty cool. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, there you have it. Episode number one of two in our Public Land Recap Show. We hope you uh, enjoyed all the information that the guys had, and there's certainly a whole bunch more to come next week. So we didn't want to give it to you in a two-and-a-half-hour show, so we broke it up into two shows. Um, if you like it, share it on Facebook, uh, it, Instagram, wherever, wherever it is that, uh, that you do your social media thing. And again, as I said at the onset of the show, if you could do us a favor and give us a review, let us know how we're doing. And uh, if you want to see something in this format next year, we're already talking about how to, uh, how to accomplish that and how to get everybody back together and do a similar show. We may not do it on necessarily just public land. We might take um, some, some folks that are pretty well accomplished and uh, get them all together and, and just talk deer hunting strategy after a um, after a, a several show series. So let us know what you think. Uh, again, on iTunes, um, if you can give us a five star rating, that would be great. Stitcher Radio, iHeart Radio, and the hundreds of other places that you can find our podcast. 
Um, I want to thank Ozonics for their support of this show. Without them, we couldn't do what it is that we're doing here. And more important than that, we want to thank you guys, the listeners. Uh, it's um, what keeps us doing this, and uh, your input is what keeps making the show better. So based on the numbers, we definitely are, are happy with uh, the people that we're reaching, and we want to thank you all for your support. With that, I'll end the show for today. Jason out.